In this video, I'm going to talk about the theme of death in William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. This isn't absolutely everything you can say about death in this play, um, but hopefully it gives you some key quotes that you could explore should this question come up in your exam. Um, so here's my overview. Yours might be very different, but this is kind of what I take from the play. Remember, it's up for interpretation. That's the wonderful thing about English literature. So because the play seems to be about these two lovers, Romeo and Juliet, it would be expected that love would be the most prominent theme in this play. However, you could certainly argue that actually death is the most prominent theme. I say that because the play opens with the foreshadowing of Romeo and Juliet's death. Remember, they are death marked. And it makes this knowing that they're going to die right from the very beginning, that creates constant feeling of tension and suspense throughout the play. Um, it's also the only resolution to the feud between the Capulets and the Montagues. Love, the love of Romeo and Juliet isn't enough to end it, it's their death that is enough to end the feud. So ultimately you might argue that the death of Ro Romeo and Juliet is the greatest force for change, not their love. So first of all, I think I would start with talking about the inevitability of death because we start by um, being informed that it, this play will end with the death of two lovers, Romeo and Juliet. So um, look at the quote, do with their death, bury their parents' strife. So the chorus tells us that right at the beginning during the prologue. So the prologue immediately introduces the theme of death indicating that it is a prominent theme in the play and clearly establishes the tragic genre. So we're very much clear that this play is not going to end um, in laughter. The audience is immediately told that death will play a greater part than love in resolving the conflict between the Montagues and the Capulets. We learn that Romeo and Juliet are death marked. So describing them in this way gives an in inevitability to their death. This is something that is unavoidable. With the audience aware of their fate, tension and dramatic irony is created throughout the play. They often um, talk about death, um, not realizing that, realizing that actually what they're saying is prophetic um, because it's going to, to come true. And then this is a little bit of a twist on, so far we've kind of looked at death as being inevitable in terms of it being the fate of Romeo and Juliet, but you could look at it in a different way. Death is not only inevitable because of fate, but it is also inevitable due to the limited options awarded to Juliet and Romeo, you could argue. Having not the freedom to choose her husband, her only agency is over her life. And we see that when she says in Act 3, Scene 5, if all else fail, myself have power to die. So when you give someone such limited options, and you can say the same for Romeo as well, because he wouldn't have been free to marry Juliet, isn't death inevitable? Because they could either choose to live without one another or die together. Thinking about how you'd link this to context, in terms of this idea of death being inevitable, remember Elizabethans believed in predetermined fate and they would likely view Romeo and Juliet's tragic end as inescapable. So fate is a greater force than love and therefore their death is a greater force than love. And just remember the modern audience would be watching this play thinking, well, this is inevitable, it's going to happen anyway. Whereas maybe a modern audience would look at this play and think about how their individual decisions have brought them to to their deaths. But that's not really how um, um, the original audience would have viewed this. Don't forget as well, with us talking about the limited options for Juliet, this is a patriarchal society. Women were considered the weaker sex. Um, even Queen Elizabeth I, who would have been the most powerful person in England at that point, was questioned um, on her ability to rule based on the fact that she was a woman. Um, and the marriage process, I'm sure you've covered this in class, especially if you were from a wealthier family, really reduced women to commodities. This was a business transaction and um, women were up for sale, basically. Feud, as the feud between the families creates this relentless cycle of death. So death permeates this play, it permeates Verona. Um, so we have what, where the civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Again, this is from the chorus. So we're initially told straight away that the backdrop of this love story is 
this violent city um, and death here is a constant threat because of this feud. The paradoxical statement highlights how pervasive the feud is by corrupting even the innocent. Because if you look, it says, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Civil really saying innocent hands unclean. But if, if you make their hands unclean, then they're not innocent anymore. So you could even link that to think about Romeo. Romeo is a pretty innocent character. He's a good person. But this feud has led him to kill Tybalt in the end, and it, eventually he kills Paris as well before committing the ultimate sin, that being um, suicide. Elizabethans would have seen that as the ultimate sin. In the first scene, Tybalt says to Benvolio, look upon thy death. So Tybalt really is a symbol of this institutionalised hate created by the feud. Um, he's dehumanised himself because he refers to himself as death personified he's almost become a weapon of his family's war and this is what happens in a feud like this it turns um, it turns human beings into robots um, the place death considering thou art this is in the balcony scene um, when Romeo has jumped over the the wall if you like to get into the Capulet garden to see Juliet and she refers to the Capulet's garden as death for him. So the Capulet garden has become an, an embodiment of death for Romeo. Ironically, the feud has made love a life-threatening endeavour for the two. And that's really quite contradictory, isn't it? But look what the feud has done, how it's affected people's lives, even their ability to love. And then after Romeo kills Tybalt, Lady Capulet demands for blood of ours shed blood of Montague. In other words, because a Capulet has died, that being Tybalt, then a Montague needs to die. So Lady Capulet's command reveals the endless cycle of such feuds that are fueled by vengeance. Can it only end with the double su suicide of Romeo and Juliet? And you can understand why this never ended. If each side are continually saying, well, some a Capulet's died and therefore a Montague needs to die. Well, Montague's just been killed, therefore we need to kill a Capulet. It's this relentless cycle. We cannot, um, we cannot avoid death with a feud like this. So is this the reason why the double suicide is necessary? Because had they taken each other's lives, then the vengeance would have continued, but they took their own. And that was the only way, really, of, of putting an end to this vengeance uh, between the families. Some context about this feud and, and the violence that comes with it. Um, during the Elizabethan times, um, fights made up the majority of violent deaths. 90% of homicides had a male defendant and 80% had a male victim. So male on male crime was really high. So that's why you mostly see this between the male characters. Men were expected to be violent in order to defend their honor. and this is the issue, this is why it's so difficult to get rid of this violence in Verona because men feel this um, necessity to prove their manliness, to prove their masculinity and again this, this fuels this cycle of death. So if you were a noble you had to constantly protect your honour against various challenges and if you wanted to avoid being considered a coward then the best way to do that is to, to challenge others for, to a duel. Um, and to make sure you accept any challenges as well. Um, otherwise you will be called a coward like Romeo was in Act 3, Scene 1. Um, also on top of this, think about the fact that Elizabethan drama was often created with a message on how to be a good citizen. Often that was kind of um, a theme that would run, at, uh, run throughout Elizabethan drama. So is this Shakespeare's attempt to encourage a reflection on the violence that seemed to permeate society at that time? Um, is he trying to say, look, you can't win with um, with such a, a violent society. We need to change. Is that what he's saying? Um, death is is described almost like a real uh, uh, thinking, feeling uh, creature. It's a force against love. So Romeo refers to it as love devouring death and he challenges it do what he dare. This is just after he's married Juliet. The verb devouring personifies death like a predator hungrily hunting love and it emphasises the vulnerability of Romeo and Juliet. If you imagine death out there like a predator looking for its prey, 
Um, Romeo's challenge to death is really naive because he's basically saying, I'm happy now. I've married Juliet and nothing can, um, nothing can take that away from me. So death, do whatever you want. I'm happy because I lived to marry my love. Um, that's not true, is it? When you think about how sad he is, um, in the end when he's going to be banished, it wasn't enough just to marry her. Um, when Juliet is found supposedly dead, remember she's not really in Act 4, Scene 5 by her father, he says, death is my son-in-law, death is my heir, my daughter he hath wedded. So death is depicted as if he were a groom who has taken everything away from Lord Capulet, emphasising his sense of loss. The repetition of death draws attention to the supposed passing of Juliet. Of course, this is also dramatic irony because the audience know that she's not really dead. But that sense of loss is really um, is really strong here. Um, and it links to this force against love because he is describing death as if it's a real... Um, it's personifying death as a groom. And it just makes... It just makes everyone seem so much more vulnerable if there really is this kind of thinking being, this creature out there called death that's waiting to take your life or to take the life of someone you love. And then at the end, the final scene, Romeo finding Juliet again, supposedly dead, um, he describes death as the lean aboard monster keeps thee here in dark to be his paramour. So he imagines death as a starving monster keeping Juliet as his lover. The horrific imagery reflects the fear associated with death and its predatory nature highlights the fragility of life. Um, something to consider we're in terms of the modern audience and timely death or mass death due to catastrophes such as plagues were looked upon as signs of god's displeasure or vengeance so would the audience have seen this as as god's vengeance because the capulets and the montagues have behaved so poorly that they have um or that god has chosen to punish them by taking their loved ones away Death is also a catalyst in the play and we're going to focus on Mercutio and Tybalt's death in this case because it really pushes the plot along. Before Act 3, Scene 1, you can class um, Romeo and Juliet much more like a comedy than it is a tragedy. Um, and so this the, it's their deaths, Mercutio's and Tybalt's death, that really turns that around because then we have the banishment of um, of Romeo and then, of course, the downfall, basically. Um, so Mercutio, on um, realising that he's, he's dying, he curses both the Capulets and the Montagues. He says, a plague on both your houses, and he repeats this a number of times. The repeated curse foreshadows the ill fate of Romeo and Juliet, and it's from this point that things will become increasingly difficult for Romeo and Juliet to be together. This day's black fate on more days doth depend. This but begins the woe, others must end. So Romeo, after killing Tybalt, realises... Uh, oh, sorry, not after killing Tybalt. After Mercutio dying, and he's about to kill Tybalt, he senses that Mercutio's death will lead to many more, indicating the transition from comedy to tragedy. And there will be many more deaths. There will be Tybalt. There will be uh, Paris. There will be Lady Montague. And then, of course, Romeo and Juliet. Is death a consequence of extreme love? Is this actually a cautionary tale? Do not love to such an extreme extent. Look what happens. Um, and we do see this extreme behaviour from Juliet and Romeo that um, raises some alarm. Um, so Juliet, after just meeting Romeo for not very long, um, when she's asking basically, is he married? She's asking the nurse, who is he, is he married? And if he is, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. So she's basically saying I'd rather die because I uh, than, um, than not marry him. I'll never marry anyone but, but Romeo. Juliet's hyperbolic claim already reveals extreme tendencies. And so we see that she, is, she has this tendency to be extreme. And is it surprising, therefore, that she ends up killing herself, you might argue? It, it could be dismissed as melodrama. But having said that, it is prophetic because that is how um, the play ends. Her grave is her wedding bed. 
Uh, Friar Lawrence sees this in both Romeo and Juliet and he warns them these violent delights have violent ends and in their triumph die like fire and powder. He foreshadows the rashness of the couple's suicides by saying this. Um, it also links to Romeo's request for a poison that will stop his breath as violently as hasty powder fired. Um, so there is this hastiness, there is this rashness to them. And again, this comes to the, uh, this comes hand, hand in hand with this fact that they are so passionate. Their love is so extreme and intense. When Romeo learns that he is banished and he is in front of Friar Lawrence, he's in his cell, and the nurse is there as well. He says, in what vile part of this anatomy doth my name lodge? Tell me that I may sack the hateful mansion. And actually what he does then is he attempts to kill himself. So he does actually attempt a suicide before um, he's successful. Romeo's dialogue reveals the extent of his unhappiness. He refers to himself as hateful and vile and so that reveals a self-loathing and a disregard for his own life. So these again are warning signs um, that he is suicidal. And then of course right at the end Romeo has already killed himself at this point. Juliet awakes to find her husband has poisoned himself and she kill, she stabs herself and she refers to the dagger, the instrument of her death as a oh, happy dagger. That's all oxymoronic and it's an exclamation um, and that helps emphasize her willingness to die. Life is not worth living according to Juliet without Romeo. And again, this all points the finger at this idea of you shouldn't love so extremely. Um, and that is very much in line with the way the Elizabethans Felt. There was a common proverb at the time that was hot love is soon cold. Passionate love was an unsafe basis for marriage according to the Elizabethans. They were quite a pragmatic bunch. So they might, the, the original audience might be watching Romeo and Juliet and just thinking this inevitably is going to end up terrible because they're just too passionate. But you can critically analyse this. Romeo, when buying his poison and hands over his gold to the apothecary he says there is thy gold worse poison to men's souls doing more murders in this loathsome world in other words here's my money which is worse poison than what i'm buying money has killed more people than this poison ever has um, this is actually the only indication we ever get of what the feud is over and that is money um, because i assume he's really thinking about this feud and how it's led them down this path um, but we never know any finer details than that. But is it, can you think, if you think about what he's saying here, is it fair to blame Romeo and Juliet's passion for their deaths? Or, in a more just and more peaceful world, would their love have still led to their deaths? Think about that. Is it really passionate love that's caused these suicides? Or is it the world that they live in and the fact that the world that they live in is so violent and so unjust that it doesn't have space for true love to blossom like Romeo and Juliet. And therefore, could you argue, it's not extreme love. That's not to blame for their, for their deaths. It's the family feud that's really to blame. And here's an interesting one, death as unsubstantial. So, um, and I'm focusing on the last scene here. When Romeo sees his dead wife, Juliet, and he says, how oft when men are at the point of death, have they been merry? So he's literally facing death because he's, he's facing his, what he thinks is his dead wife. Remember, this is dramatic irony. She's not really dead. And the exclamation reflects the exhilaration in his speech, perhaps a sense of relief to leave such a violent and conflicted world. So there's a relief, there's almost an excitement in his tone about the fact that he's about to kill himself and so at this point you might say death is unsubstantial because it hasn't changed the way he feels about Juliet and he doesn't fear death at this point and when he's looking at Juliet remember she's not really dead he says death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty so is Romeo so fearless of death because it seems to have not physically altered Juliet. So is he looking at death and kind of going, well, death doesn't look that bad, she's still so beautiful. Of course, this is dramatic irony because she's still living. But just before he takes his life, he says, 
It will shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from the world weary, from this world wearied flesh. So what he's saying here is um, he's metaphorically bearing a yoke, and that is a wooden cross piece that you would attach to two oxen to plow or to two other animals to plow. It's a really heavy piece of equipment. Um, and it's really to emphasize the heavy burden he has carried throughout his life, you might argue, not just by meeting Juliet. And from death, he will actually be relieved from that burden. This once again brings stress to the effect of the feud. Is death something to really fear when you live in a world so violent and so oppressive as the one that Romeo lives in? So is the point to be made here that death isn't so terrifying when you don't have a good life? Romeo is miserable. Uh, Romeo hasn't had the freedom to marry the, the woman that he loved. Um, he's been brought up in a world of violence. He found himself in an impossible situation where he had to kill his cousin. Um, this, is a, this is a terrible world to live in. And so is there a point to be made here about how unsubstantial death is if you have nothing to live for? Um, one thing to take into consideration and the way that the audience might view this, suicide was considered a mortal sin, was considered one of the worst sins, if not the worst sin. Um, so Shakespeare often sets suicides in distant countries um, so that the audience wouldn't feel so uncomfortable watching it because it wouldn't be so close to home. They could be like, well, that was a different country. The, this, these are different people. Um, so, so just take that in, into consideration that um, this would be a taboo topic. And then you really need to think about the overall message and that is up to you. That is up for interpretation, but think about the many ways that this could be interpreted. Um, is the theme of death there as a cautionary tale about extreme love? Look how dangerous it is to love someone to this extent. And many members of the audience would feel that way. That's the way they, they viewed love, um, especially if you were from a wealthy background. Love didn't have anything to do with marriage, remember, they were very pragmatic. Um, is it a commentary on good citizenship? So is the theme of death supposed to highlight how futile um, a feud like the Capulets and the Montagues is? No one wins, it's just this vicious cycle of death. I didn't put this in here, but you could link that to the um, conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants. And it's this relentless cycle and no one wins from it. Um, or is it just in general something more, a reminder of our immortality and the inevitability of death? It's something that everyone in the audience can relate to because one thing that is for sure in our lives is that we will die. So it's something that they share with Romeo and Juliet. Of course, Romeo and Juliet, you could argue, is an untimely death because they are so young and that's what makes it tragic. Um, there are many other ways to view this. These aren't the only three messages um, that are possible. So please share your ideas in the comment section. I do always love to hear um, what you think yourself.